All right, welcome everyone to the first legal series of our NISOS Advanced Persistent Talks. This is our video cast and our inaugural one. And I'm really excited to have some great panelists here today. I am Jennifer Detrani. I'm general counsel for NISOS and I'll be today's host. We will bring together right now a couple subject matter experts and we're gonna talk about the solar winds breach. We all know that a lot has been said about solar winds and we're hoping to get a little bit more technical and unpack some of the actionable outcomes here. So joining me today on the panel, we've got Jan Jamala Busay, Evan Wolf, and Justin Zeef. Would you gentlemen do me the favor of introducing yourselves? Let's uh, kick it off with Evan, please. And then we'll follow up with, John, with Jan and Justin. Hi, thank you, Jennifer. And it's an honor to be a part of the first legal, although I won't ask what happened to the previous ones. Were they illegal or underground <laughs> podcasts? But I'm Evan Wolf. I'm a partner and co-chair of the Privacy and Cyber group at uh, Kroll & Mooring, which is a global law firm that has uh, nine offices, about 600 lawyers. I've been a cyber lawyer for the last 15 years and, and was a data scientist and I guess worked on the other side of the keyboard in the 10 years before that, including some time at MITRE and working in the government and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of this today. Thanks for being here. Jan? I'm Jan Kamawusa and I'm a uh, security manager at Super Global Markets. I have to disclaim that these are all my personal opinions, not the opinions of my employer. That being said, I, my experience is a, a blue teamer for the last five years. And before that, I was a red teamer for the government for about eight years. And if I could add into the disclaimers, just because I, I guess I'll, I'll get wrapped on the knuckles with my various disclaimers. First is that uh, nothing I'm saying should constitute legal advice, even if it's really good or would require you to pay me. It, it isn't legal advice. And, and second of all, nothing is, is my, these are my personal opinions, not based on any client or other information that I may or may not have learned about. Awesome. And you guys kind of beat me to that because I was going to do that for all of us. But, but on behalf of NISOs also, we want to just make sure that we represent that what we're discussing today is just general consumption. This doesn't represent legal advice or create any attorney client or other professional services relationship. So please listen in and contact us after if you have any questions, but we'll put up a screen that shows how you can get in contact with everyone. So over to Justin. Hi, good afternoon slash good morning, depending on where you are. Justin Zeef, co-founder of Nisos, along with my colleague Landon, we formed the company in 2015. Prior to that, 10 years in service with the government in a capacity understanding and, and pursuing threat actors, sophisticated and less sophisticated, largely around their efforts on the digital domain. And I did NISOS in 2015 as a uh, means to help industry tackle those same problems with the mindset that uh, we bring from government. That's it for me. Okay, great. So let's get into it. I think we'll try to just go through what we think are some of the critical practical issues here, and then we'll get into some Q&A at the end. So kicking that off, we all know that the solar winds attack was a strategic espionage campaign. We know as of today with some level of certitude that this was Russian in origin. So before we really get into the details, let's talk about the supply chain attack itself. Jan, if you wouldn't mind, can you give us a little overview of what happened? I, and, and the exact days, I believe, were somewhere in Oct was it October or August. I, I can't remember exactly when fire. I de determined that they had been uh, compromised. And from that, they, they did an analysis of the network, saw that they were getting some connectivity coming from an unexpected to an unexpected device, some logins. They did the determination that it was coming from SolarWinds. They, that was, they were contacted in turn in December. The warrants or the notifications were put out to everyone to state, hey, there's a problem here. It came through DHS because it was, it's actually kind of a matter of national security at this point, because as you can imagine, a lot of the government uses solar winds in addition to Fortune 500 companies. I think there was a total of 18,000 known incidences that, that uh, are still under research and individual companies are still trying to determine what's going on. And the actual period of time for the Compromise of solar winds as a company is unknown, at least not specifically known. The supply chain attack started, though, at least, I believe, in, I have to double check my time dates at this point, but it, I think it's been at least for a few months. October is, I think, when the, is, is, is at least the, the latest that it has. So I think it might, it's, been, it's been longer than that, even. Yeah, I think I think it, I think my understanding is it's between March and December. Yeah. And I and just to back up a little bit, so so the the solar winds itself, 
that's an IT management platform, correct? So a lot of companies and the government relies on that heavily to understand its 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 network configurations. Is that right? Right. Yeah. It's it's used for managing network configurations for large topologies. It, it, it's a, it's a very good tool to make sure things are working there in the correct status configurations. Make sure everything's as expected, basically. Got it. Got it. Okay. And and Evan, I know you've talked a lot about this uh, this attack, and it's pretty fascinating how 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 deep they got and all of the ways that that happened. Can you tell us a little bit about how how the attack was actually orchestrated, like the updates and how it was pushed to all of the the environments? Yeah, just building off of what what Jan said, you know, it it really did start back in uh, you know September of nineteen when when the threat actor had access to the SolarWinds environment and. And, and began injecting and testing code in their, I assume their development environment first, or uh, actually unclear where it was injecting code into, but it did that for a few months up until it looked like no, November. And, and all of this comes from the, the SolarWinds AK filing to those that are uh, not on the legal side, but on the uh, tech side. AKs are a disclosure that, that certain, size, certain companies have to disclose to the SEC, and they do it in the form of a of a regulatory filing and uh, m- most publicly traded companies have some version of 10Ks or 10Qs or 8Ks. And, uh, and so it really, you know, it, it, that's when the threat actor began building what's really seen as a very novel and, and sophisticated backdoor into the SolarWinds, the, the Orion software, the software that SolarWinds uses to, 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 to do the, you know, once again, widely used by I think the numbers over 300,000 customers and 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 then it, and then what what began happening then is the the threat actor was able to use that access to 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 and this is where the word supply chain attack becomes the sort of most important description to then attack others in the supply chain and and since it wasn't known about at the time you know we didn't know about it until over a Almost a year later, until the sort of the, the good work of of a fire eye, you know, it really was a sort of an invisible attack, but also began attacking. It's sort of like the the thing that at least th- those of us that have been around sort of security for for a decade or more, it sort of was the what we always thought of was our equivalent of like a Pearl Harbor was when someone starts, you know, getting in in a supply chain very deep and very and very wide and and with such persistence that we weren't able to determine it. And that's that's what's so different and significant and and about 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 the sunburst solar wind attack. And sunburst is the name of the actual malware, the back door itself. Is, I know people throw around a, a, a ton of names, especially to the lawyers in the on the call that are quickly Googling. We'll try to do as much decoding as we can during the course of the podcast. <laughs> so, so now we've got a lot of companies kind of scrambling to figure out what it means to have to possibly have a backdoor in your system. Before we get into like focusing on what it means from a from a legal perspective and what 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 companies are trying to do to remediate or to understand, and also what security practitioners are doing as far as best practices here. Justin, can you tell us a little bit about what we know about who is behind this attack? Yeah, it's, I believe there's near universal consensus that this was a uh, Russian government sponsored attack as distinct from sanctioned. This was their activity on their dime. There was some rumblings that this might be SVR, but it's looking more and more like uh, an FSB operation. There are, I think just today or yesterday, some reporting that shows similarities in what you could think of as the signature style or the the, the handwriting style of the code that was utilized and the manner in which it was compiled and, and, and built seems to match some of the code that they've used in the past. And there are other uh, indicators as well that, uh, that this was a Russian operation and of course, makes sense that it would be this. This would be a you know a, a tier one target for them, if not their most valuable operation that they've got going. Awesome. Okay, so we've laid the foundation. So, so over to you, Evan. What kind of problems does this present from a legal standpoint? What what are lawyers like you focused on on behalf of companies who are seeking guidance? Yeah, I mean, I always think of investigations, and since I sort of 
do do investigations for a living, I always think of them as like a an onion on some level that we have to start off with the the first part of any investigation needs to to be an understanding of of does the does the third party or in this case the threat actor have any sort of persistence are we safe can we trust and use the environment and the infrastructure that we think was accessed and and really that 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 includes sort of a you know a doing a quick remediation oftentimes that involves bringing in third parties such as forensic firms sometimes even excellent forensic firms like nisos and uh, and, and and in which case we want to make sure that that is a privileged engagement and that's the first part that is is sort of, I would say, fraught with peril given there's been some recent court rulings coming out of, actually Capital One was the last of the court rulings, but of, of how to safely engage third-party forensic firms to, to, to make sure that, that that is covered under the attorney-client privilege and that you're, you know, it's a part of the conveying of, of legal advice. But that's really this, the first step of, of determining sort of, you know, is, is, can you use the environment? Is it safe? And then, and then you begin the second sort of tranche, which is, is really the investigation of, of, of what happened, what data was, what, what information and systems were accessed. And, and, and that's sort of the, what I would say, the, the technical path. And at the same time, there's sort of a, a legal and, and management team that's looking at all the potential regulatory risk. And that's the first piece that companies need to assess. Are there any compelling, you know, do you have any privacy data or any payment card information? Or do you have any of these sort of specific types of data that would require you that, that require you to tell some about, about the incident? And then, and then the second, area and, and include in that regulatory risk are things like if you have any federal government information or access to federal information systems, the, the DOD and, and the rest of the government has been very quickly putting together a set of over the past quickly since 2013 has put together a set of clauses, contractual clauses that require you to disclose within 72 hours. So that's the regulatory piece. And then the second area is companies have to review their contracts and their 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 business agreements with with others, everything from like their vendors to to sort of their suppliers and and their customers, and determine what sorts of, of, of reporting obligations are are there, and then and then once you've done that sort of legal analysis, then you begin the sort of the, the hard part, which is to start to tell people, and that that could be in, in a lot of different forms, as we've you know t- talked about. There's SEC filings. There's direct customer notifications. Many companies have heard from Microsoft that were a, a also a victim of this attack and they've informed upwards of 40 companies to of 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 the, the that they may have been involved in a in a related incident. So these are all these are all you know parts of the the sort of investigation and notification process that the, the companies are in the middle of right now, to be honest, that's sort of what, what, what I think almost every, every, every cyber lawyer out there is sort of focused on right now. That's helpful. And we'll get into some of the details on that, because in particular, some of them get pretty interesting, like how do you preserve forensically, like the evidence here, going back to the concept of like going about this the right way, starting from attorney-client privilege. But I want to get over to Jan, because I know in our prior discussions, you've talked about this sort of always breached model of business, right? Where you, you start from the mindset of, of, of the concept that you might have already been owned. And so what, is that, what does that mean here? And how are security practitioners like thinking about this? I'm sure there's a lot of like Monday, you know, morning quarterbacking where you're saying I should have done this. But at the same time, the fact that it's hit so many companies must be a bit leveling in a sense. What, what's your take on it? Right. So the uh, oh, always breached model or the, is is basically the idea that you you assume that your network already has an attacker on it at any given time. So uh, if that's the case, you depending on the size of your company, you should plan on having a threat hunt team constantly vigilantly looking for something, some sort of indicators of compromise. Because the likelihood is, especially if you have a larger company. You actually do have something going on. You might not know what it is yet. It might not be as significant as as this particular solar flare Orion sunburst incident, but it could also be it could be this. So uh, always breach is first of all a security model where you minimize your access on a per host basis. In the case of a solar flare with Orion, a lot of companies probably don't think in terms of blocking out administrative access to a solar flare Orion server. 
you know, this is typically run on Windows, or, and by running it with with that, with that too, too high of a privilege access or and the ability to do things like delegate tokens on domain controllers, you're basically creating a scenario in which should a attacker get onto the Orion host, they may easily gain more access throughout your network, especially as administrators log in and to investigate it, those credentials can be stolen. This is all in an always breach model. You're much more careful with how you log into these kind of hosts so that the accounts are, are limited access. If someone were to steal those credentials, they can't do anything besides potentially get onto an, another Sol SolarFlare Orion instance host or you know, device that's already been controlled by this, the Orion software. So that, that's the idea of always breaches. You, you minimize everything as much as possible. And so, and so beyond that, how, how are security practitioners thinking about this? Like what does this, is there a call for better practices? If we look at one of our audience members, you know, sends a really great question in, which is how did this happen? Is there a good reason why SolarWinds wasn't performing forensic audits? against those updates, like, could this have been prevented? How do we, how do we look back at this and try to learn from it and prevent this from happening again? So I think that this is going to be an eye opener in, for some companies, companies that deal with large customers, companies that have developers that develop in-house code to resell, particularly because if you look at the code, it technically says it's digitally signed by this SolarFlare team it looks legit. It will, it will come pass with flying colors through most IDS, IDS, IPS, antivirus, and all other suites of software. And whatever it won't pass will be potentially new domains that it was connecting to, which are related to the attackers, to the actors that are using this. And judging that it's coming from digitally signed software, most companies would be looking at that and saying, you know what, we're going to let that through because it probably does need to go through. Particularly, since this is coming from a, a host that's designed to con for network management, a lot of companies may make the mistake of thinking that they need to give extra access to this host. It's a common mistake. It used to be done with uh, Windows domain controllers and users. The administrators would give it internet access when there's really no need to do such a thing. Likewise with Orion, there, there really is in many ways, in many cases, no need to give internet access to these kind of hosts. And yet we do it because it simplifies administration, it simplifies updates. And, and this is one of the repercussions. Now, from a you know, quarterbacking perspective on, on looking at what this looks like as an aftermath, the postmortem, uh, I think that a lot of companies are hopefully going to re recognize that the need for things that they've already heard from their security practitioners, whether it's network segmentation or it's um, minimal privileges for accounts, Hopefully, I'm sure some companies got hit by the classic usage of a Windows administrative account to administer the Orion server, which would could be devastating potentially. Fortunately, there's also uh, pretty strong indicators that allow most companies to be able to determine should they be logging well, which is another critical aspect of, of working through this particular incident is if they have enough logging, they'd be able to determine whether or not the compromise is actually deactivated by the attackers. Now, does that mean that the attackers off the network? Not necessarily, but it would potentially mean that the attack, you know, when the attacker stopped looking at your Orion host as the uh, point of entry into your network, at least. Got it. And I actually read somewhere that uh, I think in connection with the class la action lawsuit against, against SolarWinds, they're alleging that the update server password was actually SolarWinds123, <laughs> which, right. which I, I think, you know, we see that happen quite a bit where companies get a little bit lackadaisical in that. And, and obviously, if you've got a nation state kind of sitting on the other end of things waiting for you to mess up, that's a great place to, to give them a point of entry. Towards that point, what are the implications of this from a U.S. government national security standpoint? Justin, you've got some background that might help us uh, answer that. I think all of us do, but I'm happy to take a take a crack at that. Yeah, I mean they're they're extraordinary to put a fine point on it. Th these actors knew what they were doing. They moved low and slow. Solar Winds is has been known to have had administrative credentials for sale on the dark web as early as 2017. It's no surprise, it should be no surprise to anybody that a company like this, which is generally allowed to have privileged access to the environments in which it operates and to update remotely, is going to be a target for, for, for the actors. So what are the impacts, national security impacts? Well, 
you know, understanding how these attackers work, especially the well-financed ones who are able to move low and slow over a period of time to minimize uh, the likelihood of detection. They're going to gain entry, establish persistence, move laterally, and then move vertically and, and try and you know, capture the flag or assert control over the domain controller or something that they can do while still remaining undetected. And so it's, you know, to, to Jan's point about not seeing any communications with the initial command and control servers that had been established to, you know, to support Orion as they were making their way into the environment, they can abandon those once they've established secondary or tertiary access to the environment. And if they are able to, and in reporting is that they were, eliminate their, the, 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 the trail or the fingerprints or the forensics evidence of their, of their presence on the network, as well as any information that they might have exfiltrated or anything that they might have additionally placed on the network. If they're able to wipe those things, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to determine where in the environment they remain, whether they remain. And I mean, you, you have to do what you, either you are unplugging your entire network and rebuilding from scratch, or you're going to be doing a persistent threat hunt to figure out what that is. What are the impacts? I mean, they're financial, they're economic, they're national security related without really knowing, you know, the the, the bulk of what those 18,000 targets were, but also understanding that there seems to be an impression. I'm not sure where the facts are that support this, but it makes sense that they were only going to be aggressive with the targets that were of the most interest to them. This is not an attempt, likely not an attempt, almost impossibly an attempt to just capture PII and to do ransomware and all of that. This is, this is a really sophisticated effort. So I don't think we know yet what the implications are. I'm sure that they include defense-related information that was taken from large defense contractors. I'm sure it includes information that can be used to exploit individuals for, for blackmail in the future. I'm sure that there are being made to collect information that can then be resold or reused later on after this breach was exposed to enable financial gain. There, if you can think of a consequence that could that could damage national security, it's it's here in this in this incident. Well, that's pretty daunting. And I know on the government, the government on both sides, one is trying to respond to this threat themselves, but on the other side is prescriptively trying to help provide some guidance to companies through CISA, DHS has released some guidance. Evan, how do you, how do you kind of get, like, given all of the different ways that you described the impacts from a legal perspective, like how are you practically guiding companies here? Because there's a lot that, obvi and obviously it's very specific to, to each company, but from, from taking the advice of, of CISA as far as like preserving and trying to understand the network, the network harm to chain of custody and trying to preserve forensic evidence for purposes of lawsuits or even using your cyber insurance to try to redress this. How do you really walk a client through this in a way that they can deal with? And I'm assuming it's a multi-stakeholder, you know, situation at companies. Yeah, that's, it's a great question. And I, I usually start off the kickoff call with sort of, I have a, everyone since I've done a few hundred incidents, I always have the same speech that some people are a little sick of, but I start off by first reminding a company that they're a victim and to something that Jan said, even if you, let's say you're a government contractor and you've implemented all of the NIST 800-171 controls or you're working towards your cyber security maturity modeling certification, that doesn't mean you can't have an incident like this. And you know, not, and it also doesn't mean that you're not in compliance with those controls. You can be in perfect compliance with a standard or a regulation and still have an incident or a hack. And so I remind companies that they are a victim of a crime. And, and I think that's important to remember. The other thing I say quickly behind that is, you know, companies in general don't get in trouble for getting hacked. I think there might be some companies in this case that may, may have a different opinion on that, but they get in trouble for how they respond and, and you're kind of on the clock. And so you have to be very thoughtful and mindful and in your incident response and, and recovery. And it really is the sort of those, those two elements of it. So the first piece has to be, and this is where sort of, you know, my good friend and brother, Justin and I, and, and all the other IR responders and I sort of get in arguments because they, you know, I, I wanna preserve evidence. I wanna take as many images. I'm all about trying to find out what we can, can we, if, if machines are still running, can we get the memory off them before we, and, and oftentimes, and this isn't always the case, but, you know, the, the forensic vendors 
first thought is to, you know, either gather enough information and start getting threat actors, especially if they have active operations on a network off. And, and it becomes sort of this, you know, this sort of challenge of, of how much information can we collect and how long can we stay, you know, in, a, in an infected state versus what is the risk of, of, of beginning to, and, and it's especially difficult when you deal with these sort of advanced persistent threat actors where you have to be very thoughtful about how, what your remediation looks like. And you really need to take advice from seasoned professionals who have done this before. Because what happens if you just sort of clean up one part of your network, they'll show up at not one, but five other parts of your network. And you have to really take a sort of a very, a very sort of global approach to that remediation. And so evident pre preservation and, 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 uh, and remediation sort of go hand on hand, but it's, it's you know, I would say it's still an, an art form. There are some requirements for, for, for this that you companies have to think about, like, once again, not picking on government contractors, but they are focused here, you know, under the, under the new, the, 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 the clause, what's called the safeguarding clause or the 7012 DFARS clause. They're required to, if they've had an incident on a covered information system which is the sort of the trigger for reporting. They not only need to report within 72 hours of discovery, but they also need to preserve that information on that network, the, the information system for, for, for 90 days. So, so there is sort of a legal requirement for some parts of the investigation, but ultimately it, it really, it, it comes down to sort of working really collaboratively between the, you know, between all elements, as you mentioned, sort of a team sport, especially the initial few calls where, where we're kicking these things off, where, where we need to be informed by, by the, 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 the forensics and what is the goal of the investigation. But we also need to be aware of what are the legal requirements and, and, it's, and it's sort of a, a blend of both. And I'm, I'm assuming that that communication goes all the way up to the board, right? Because this becomes a reputation sort of injuring event that companies have to do, they have to address properly, or there's going to be long-term repercussions. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, so it, it, I mean, it, it, yes, increasingly boards are involved in significant cyber incidents, but companies need to be thoughtful of their, of, 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 and, and careful and sort of what they tell the board. And once again, boards have a very, of companies, especially publicly traded companies have a specific role in terms of providing oversight and uh, to, to companies. So they need to know about it quickly and, and they need to have the information that's, that's, that's important. But they also, you know, it, it, you know, you don't wanna yell fire without explaining what your plan is to evacuate. Sorry for the bad analogy, evacuate all the, all the people and, and start putting out the fire. And that's where I, you know, I always sort of, when, when we do board notifications, I wanna make sure we're not only explaining what the problem is, but what 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 the company is using, what what the resources, and and what the company is doing to sort of solve solve the problem, and that's also true for in, insurance insurance notification. You know, I'm a huge fan of of checklists. So just to, so Jan and and Justin don't start beating me up. I'm not saying we should do security by checklist, but using checklists as a way of making sure that you're you're, you're understanding what your, you know, what your notification and, and what the steps of the process are, because notifying also insurance companies is, is, is required and they, they are often eager to hear about this and, and will, will pay. I mean, it, the coverage depends on the policy, but, but having sort of an open conversation with them, but also just because I'm a lawyer, thinking about what you're telling them, because once you're, you tell a third party, it's no longer protected under privilege. So you also have to be thoughtful about, about that. And I, I guess one of the good things is that we've, in our industry, we've we've done a lot of tabletop exercises and incident responses. Nothing new to to any of the people on this call. But Jan, do you have any particular advice about how, as a security practitioner, especially within the financial services industry, which is highly regulated, how best to communicate these types of things, or how best to work with other stakeholders on these types of projects to? to get the result that you need and to execute against these checklists effectively. Right. So, you know, security should be working with our, the uh, audit team and the compliance team, depending upon what the exact, the, the organization and how it's regulated. But ultimately the things that need to happen are you, you, you need to develop a game plan. And, and, and to Evan's point, a checklists are a good thing, especially from a postmortem perspective. You, you do need to, Make sure you, you have things like chain of custody properly mapped out. Otherwise, you, you lose integrity of your data and, and, and then the ability to prosecute on it is, is you know, diminished. 
and I'm not even talking from a law enforcement perspective, I'm talking from an internal perspective, you will know exactly what you're looking at. Likewise, I, I think that you just need to make your audit and your compliance teams partners and not adversaries. And some, some companies, it, it's not uncommon to feel like security is constantly being pushed. And, and in this case, that's, that's not going to work. You need to work together to, to use, the, use these as tools to create the findings you need to make sure the systems you need are properly configured. From a threat response perspective, once you're there, that it's, it's a question of looking through all the forensics, obviously, and, and sometimes you can, you shouldn't have any problems, but you know, it's, it's helpful. I just want the record to reflect that I had a security professional agree that a checklist is a good thing for all the security <laughs> professionals that hate checklists, so I want that to be known. We have it recorded. Yeah, hey, I'm afraid uh, that there might be a gap in the recording here. Engineers take a look at that later on. I think it might have been uh, hacked, and there may be a deep fake going on here too. So you got to watch out for that. <laughs> yeah, these these now you. Evan, I like check. I like checklists too. I'm going through a checklist right now, so so I, I particularly like it. I'm going to move down that checklist and hit you up with another question, which is, how are regulators going to be looking at this incident? Hopefully, slowly and cautiously, and <laughs> with a lot of empathy and compassion for all human. Hu whole humankind. I mean, look, this is, uh, and I think just without sounding like the old guy here, which I, I may be, you know, I was working at a company during Midnight Maze during the original attack of, on, on the Department of Defense and, and, and the uh, defense infrastructure at the time. And, and really, you know, what we, we learned from, from not only the attack, but the investigation in the attack from which you know, we got such seminal pieces of work like the Lockheed Martin kill chain and which eventually led to the attack framework and and sort of all the things we think about now. It's, it's it, you know, if we're just trying to play a game of gotcha for these types of sort of long-term systemic in investigations or attacks, it's not that helpful. But if we really, you know, do a, a lot of sort of, I would call it almost soul searching, and, 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 and figure out how we can come together to do things. And, and luckily, I would argue, we were already on the path to doing this. And so if there are any regulators listening to this, what I would say is sort of, you know, the answer is without making it sound like we're also a, a, a Buddha Dharma podcast, but you know, the, the answer is already sort of in front of you. If we look at the, the basics of what the cyber, cybersecurity maturity modeling certification and the NIST 800 standards, if we look at what, what industry has been doing in general around the cybersecurity framework and, and these ideas of how we sort of assess maturity and, and, and begin to sort of create these sort of ways for companies and industry to work together. I mean, I, the one thing in the SolarWind AK or one of the things in the SolarWind AK filing that I like the most is they really focused on the unprecedented information sharing they've had and industry has had together. And, and the more we can come together and do a collective defense is great. And, and the good news is not only do we have a regulatory framework that does that for many of us, we just finished a, a sort of, you know, a very, a very comprehensive long-term review with the Cybersecurity Solarium Commission, which was a sort of congressional led, but, but, but bipartisan and very encompassing review that, that led to a set of recommendations. And those recommendations have actually already, many of them, I believe almost half of them have been implemented into law in the, in the most recent National Defense Authorization Act. And, and so, you know, we have many of these pieces in front of us. So instead of saying, like we did around Midnight May, is that, oh, you know, we don't even know how to answer these questions. It, it should be to regulators. Okay, what, what do we need to do more of? What do we need to do less of? But let's not reset the playing field. Because that, that is really, I, I think that would be un, unhelpful. And, 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 and my last point is that, as I remind every call I'm on with the FBI or DOJ, that that my clients and these companies are yet again, once again, victims of, of, of a cyber incident. None of these companies have scud missile defense programs and they don't worry about defending themselves from foreign nation state missile attacks. And so they shouldn't be responsible for defending themselves in this case entirely on their own. And, and it's that sort of coming together piece that, that, we, that this is really a demonstration of how we need to evolve. And, and that's why I sort of, I, I always begin every, every sort of uh, thought or when I teach class with the uh, let's talk about collective defense and, and, and operational collaboration and that's what works in the battlefield and that's what needs to happen here as well. Some great points I, and I think I think you're absolutely right that there's a growing sense that without collaboration between private sector and public sector like we're not going to be able to 
be able to overcome these types of attacks effectively. And so we've got to start trusting each other, working together. And, I, and I've seen like CISA be a big part of that. It's been very heartening and very cool to kind of learn from each other along the way. So uh, awesome. I, well, any final thoughts from the panel before we move into some questions? No pressure. Uh, I, I mean, oh, go ahead, John. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, so I think that the, this attack, the, uh, the attack in Solar Flares, uh, Orion software is probably going to be in retrospect viewed, not unlike the NSA's program, prison project are uh, being open wide and people being in, informed about it. You know, the, when prison was, was made open and public, one of the first things that happened and is still happening to this day is everyone is switching to SSL and encrypted communications for their HTTP traffic. And I, I think that likewise companies, and this, this is going to affect more corporate because this is, is this kind of software issue is more of a corporate problem than it is a individual problem, but people are going to take much more interest in the idea of, you know, validity of code, making sure that software that is running on a network is, is running in a way that it's supposed to. I think people are going to be much more reticent to believe that just because I downloaded it from a known good place, I should assume that this is good software. I think this is always breach used to be a model on a per host basis or potentially on a per user basis. But now for the first time, I think we're going to be moving in much more to a per process basis, which is to say, I don't trust any of my processes talking to any other process on my computer even. So how do I make that happen? And ironically, I think we've already been moving in that direction on the mobile front with mobile OSs like iOS where there, and uh, Android to some extent where things are much more compartmentalized and that the shared memory space is much smaller. I, I think that this is just going to be even more further pushed across the, the entire enterprise and across the PC and, and general workstation server model too. Yep, I, I think that's, uh, that those, are, those are great, great comments and definitely worth tracking. And that, that concept of zero trust, I think, is really permeating our society. Even over the past decade, it's been pretty clear that privacy is, is something we need to protect pretty carefully. And, and companies companies need to be very careful about how they choose their tools. I think here it's a little bit concerning, though, because this seemed like a very mainstream tool that companies could just bring on. And there was a sense of security around its use, I mean, as evidenced by the fact that so many companies we're relying on it, not 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 the least of which is the U.S. government. So that that piece, I think, is going to be kind of interesting. That even if you meet the standards that are required, how do you actually still prove up the ability to withstand a nation-state attack? Like that might be a rhetorical question <laughs> right there, but that's probably the crux of the issue for a lot of security practitioners and and legal practitioners alike. I'll add a note about what I. Th what's next, right? What, with all of the networks that have been compromised, number unknown, how are the threat actors going to leverage the access that they gained? Because I think that's an important question and implies effect, the result of the cause that we'll start seeing in the near term for some of these companies. It's likely that as the, presumably the Russians got in, they were collecting, exfolding all of this data, maintaining, like I said, you know, moving around the environment, establishing persistence. They were collecting all of this information that they could uh, capitalize on either literally by monetizing it or by using that information to um, support their own political or economic goals internally. But they weren't going to action some or much of that information because it could tip the hand that they were, that they had, you know, gained that access. So I think now that the gig is up, so to speak, in terms of this modality, I think we're going to see them to start monetizing or profit profitizing off of the data that they've taken, whether that's by dumping, you know, uh, selling creds to environments that are sensitive where they've lost that access or by selling the information that they exfilled from that environment. You know, you can think of them, think of them as a butcher who is not going to just take the, you know, the T-rib, the, 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 the T-bone out of the cow and throw the rest of it away. They're going to find a way to use everything that they can extract all the way down to the pelt. And so whether that is, you know, aggregating PII and then selling that later on in the dark web or sharing it with another adversary of the United States so that they can conduct their own operations, there's going to be a lot of fallout. And if I were, you know, running an organization, enterprise organization, and we give this advice all the time, I'd be very cautious and attuned 
to evidence outside of my own firewall that threat actors either have this information or are seeking this information or are aware that this information is for sale somewhere, because that's a good early indicator that you've got a problem. And then I'd also note, you know, if you remember NotPetya a few years back, that was a supply chain attack, which went a bit awry because it, 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 it the, 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 vict- the victim, the set of victims was larger than was intended because, and I don't remember the name of the program, but it was like a word editing software program out of the Ukraine that they had backdoored. And that's how they, that's how they spread NotPetya. So this is, you know, the second known large supply chain attack conducted by the Russians, probably more, but at least the second one I'm aware of. Oh, so does this go towards, oh, Evan, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. No, I, I was just going to quickly add in because I, I, I think Justin brought up a good, good point. I think, you know, the, the one word we haven't talked about today at all is the, the G word for governance. And, and this really is going to represent the, the rise of the CISO, the CISO, it's Chief Information Security Officer, and also the rise of CISO, the DHS Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity Agency. But, uh, but specifically within companies, I, I would say, especially coming out of, there was some recent DOJ actions against a specific CISO earlier in the year that the companies often don't understand and don't have clear alignment on, on what the role of a chief information security officer is. They, they are you know, a, a, a part of the, the, the C-suite but they're often not sort of given the same sort of cloud or credibility of a CFO and they don't have the same sort of accountability of other officers. And, and I think, you know, what this represents because, you know, once again, a company could have, you know, have a, a very strong investment in security as we've seen many of these victim companies have invested, you know, hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars in security and they still were a victim of it. And so therefore you have to look more than just what you're, what you're spending or what you're doing, and it has to be a part of the governance, of, a part of how you train employees, and what what you do, and in, in in terms of annual reviews and audits, red teaming is an essential skill going forward. But you also need to have someone in the middle of all of this, that's that's orchestrating this, and that skilled professional, that chief information security officer, is is more important now than it was before. And I think hopefully we will leave behind us. The, the CISO wars or the CISO dark days when every time there was an incident, a CISO got removed because that's not, that. first of all, it's not helpful to the organization, but also for incidents like this, you need to learn and grow more and, and CISOs in organizations need to be valued, appreciated and invested in. And that's, I'm hoping that's what, what we'll see come out of this is, is, is that continued sort of understanding and appreciation for, for them. I saw, I saw Jan nodding a lot when you said all that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just so, understanding more and appreciating more. Go ahead, Jan. I, I think that quite a few companies out there kind of uh, missed the boat when it comes to the purpose of a CISO. A lot of companies, we, we talked about compliance earlier, and frankly, a lot of companies are doing it for regulatory or compliance requirements and bringing little to no heed to the actual meaning and purpose of what, what a CISO is going to provide them. It's not uncommon to have the, you're here because we needed to have you, but don't say anything attitude toward the CISO. And this, this is more, was more common probably 10 to 15 years ago. It's, it's diminished in the last three or four years due to some of the more high profile attacks, I think, but it's still, it's still out there. And I think it's improving. I think that the, the, maybe the correct model is the one that I believe John Strand is credited with, is that if you think of a, a company as a race car, compliance is a rear view mirror. It lets you see back at what you've done and, and where you've been. And it's critical still to know where you're, where, where, what you need to do in some instances if you wanna do certain maneuvers. But ultimately the security is, is like the brakes. It's a critical aspect of the vehicle and ultimately you'll crash if you don't watch out what you're doing. If you keep on trying to go faster and faster without paying attention to what you have ahead of you. And I, th- I think that model applies here. I, th- I think that a CISO should be applied as effectively the the person who not only provides the governance, obviously, but also provides a direction to the overall security posture and security model of a company based on the requirements of that company. And it should be non, not viewed so much as an adversary or adversarial relationship in a company as much as a incredibly important partner that frankly will be underappreciated most of the time and hopefully able to provide the needs uh, of the company at, at critical times, like for instance, now. Yeah, now, I would say now is a very critical time. And I just wanted to pivot back to Justin's comment because I know he mentioned repercussions and, and, and let's say company credentials or things for sale on the dark web. 
and and that's probably an area that I see quite a bit in our practice, right? Where you have a CISO, he's got a certain set of tools, he's got certain people that he can rely on, but outside of that, there's other places that he needs to be able to access in order to be effective in his role. And so just like, you know, we or me, you know, I rely on my outside counsel to help round out my skill set and my generalist sort of approach to how I protect my company. We NISOs come in and, and look at a lot of those um, instances and sort of provide some insights where those insights aren't already available. So I just think that's a that's a place where I think we might see some of this coming and, and definitely from a company standpoint, we're seeing some of that activity as well. All right, let's, let's kind of wrap up our chat and head over to the Q and A. I've got a couple questions that came in side channel and then there's one that's up about cyber command. This is a question. It's been reported that cyber command will be pulled out of NSA and made independent. How will that help if it will? And if there, is there any useful, is there anything useful there for private companies? Any comments on that? I would maybe start with Evan because he started talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to uh, I, I, I am, since I'm the one who gets paid by the word here, not, uh, not John and Justin. I will. No, I mean, just to start off, yeah, I think there, I think President Trump, the in December, I believe at the end of his administration, he began the process of, of appointment of, of separate individuals for the head of Cyber Command and the head of NSA. Up until now, it had been a dual hat organization, meaning the commander had a central command for both. And I believe it was the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017 that put together sort of a test of how that separation occurs because it was, uh, I think, General Alexander, who was then the, the head of both sort of you know, set, set the government down the path that eventually there there should be a se- separation between Cyber Command and NSA, but there can't be any impact to Cyber Command and separating them out. And that's sort of the, I think, the test that the 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 Congress gave to the Secretary of Defense and the Joint the Joint Chief of Staff that you know once you can once you can understand that there's not going to be an impact to to Cyber Command, then you can separate out the roles, but that's, I mean, that's sort of a, a cool geeky, like lawfare like thing, but, but what's really, I think, important to the discussion of solar wind is the, is I think really the tremendous role the government's played in, in working with companies. And I'm not talking about sort of DOJ and FBI and sort of the, uh, the, the compulsory, the subpoena type work, but, but the work that DHS and, 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 and NSA and, and others have, have played in sort of quickly analyzing some of the, the command control infrastructure, getting information, sort of collaborating like they did during the uh, you know election cycle to protect the election system. I think this has really been a not a success in that you know we all were hacked, but a success in and I think the response coming out of government was very cohesive and unified and very helpful to companies. So that's my happy thought for the day. I like that. Anyone else want to jump in on that one or should we move to a, a final side channel question? No takers. Okay, the question coming in is, uh, how, does this change how we should be thinking about reasonable security standards? So presumably, does, does, the, does the attack itself change like how, we move, how it moves the needle towards assessing what's reasonable, I assume? I'm guessing you're reasonable in terms of what you should protect or reasonable in terms of how you should defend your network or your estate. I, I, I think of reasonable right. security standards as like a term of art that usually comes right. up in, in the sense of trying to assess compliance. So yes, I think I, like I would a negligence case, yeah. what is what is reasonable security? Uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to start off or. Oh, no, I think this yeah. is this is far okay. well, here, I mean, I'll first look at house. <laughs> like the, the stucky for the day on all the questions no one else wants to answer. So no, I mean, I, look, I, I do, I think the, the precursor to that question, and, and as I learned in my media training, always, always deflect questions with questions, um, is, is really, you know, is there, is there a supply chain security standard out there right now? And I would argue, you know, it, there really isn't a comprehensive one. I do think companies are, you know, once again, there's been like, you know, if you're in the payment card infrastructure or, or, or in the healthcare sector, you have specific requirements for how you protect your data, your network, what, 
what you and 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 I guess the best version of this was what what DoD was trying to do with the is trying to do with the cybersecurity maturity modeling certification. Where we're saying we're not going to focus on individual company, but your whole supply chain. So, I, I, but I think those are all different versions. But but even you know CMMC is going to affect over 130,000 companies, and even in just the 2021, the six contracts that they're focused on is is 700 companies. And so this is a massive. If we think about a company, an individual company going through and securing a supply chain, that's a, a really sort of massive and cost intensive process. And it works well in the defense sector because the government, some of these are allowable costs and the government can pay for it. So what we really, I think, you know, are gonna need to do over the next five and 10 years if we wanna get serious about supply chain is come up with standards that are not focused on an individual sector, but can work across. And, and this is actually where I, I know Johan and Justin and I all started thinking about where the security industry started thinking about things like the SANS 20 or the CIS 20. And when we came up with what are the basic security standards that if we all have this basic hygiene, we're all kind of okay. And I think in some case we need to go back to those types of standards so we can then, because to, to pick on accountants, because they're easy to pick on, you know, we don't have like companies going through and saying every company has different accounting standards. And so therefore, when we have to reconcile books across global companies, they all have sort of, we've all agreed on these commonalities in, in general. And, and we need to sort of come up with a, a, a common agreement. So I would argue that I think, I think this is a, a, another sort of, sort of just a, a reflection that, that as a sort of, at least in the U.S. and businesses in the U.S. really need to think not only about their own network security, but sort of in the CISO you know, three, 4.0 role is really come up with what is the, what is their role in protecting their supply chain? Good answer. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, I think re, what's reasonable. I, I totally agree with that. And I think what's reasonable, I think is also a metric of what, what a reasonable company would do or how, how a reasonable company would have approached this. And the, and those standards kind of move me into our next question, which just came in, which is, did effective security teams prevent this from affecting their networks? So can we look at companies that avoided this attack and think that they did something different than what other, other otherwise decent security teams would have done? Jan, that's a, that's a question directly for you, if you don't mind. So I, th I think it would be disingenuous to say that you I think honestly, to, to be perfectly blunt, I think you, a lot of companies got lucky. They got really lucky because the uh, net was cast so wide that there is no way that they were going to try to go for every target and try to fully execute on every target. So there's a strong likelihood that a lot of people just weren't a, weren't a, a area of interest. And so they, they, got, they could clean up much more easily. To say that any company is completely clean, I, I think would be uh, foolhardy because Short of having your solar flare Orion instant, uh, your instances of it running in a container in such a, a containerized in such a way and segmented off your network in such a way that it could only talk network devices in the internet, you would still have a huge potential for attack since all your network devices would have been controlled by it. So I I, I think that anyone who thinks that they're they got out completely clean probably isn't uh, too far off the mark, but they're, they're, it's so difficult to know that for sure. You're, you're dealing with a attacker who didn't have any known forensics and potentially even heuristics won't catch. So how do you know for sure? I mean, ultimately you, it's all best effort. I think the more, I would actually have more faith in companies that say that we, we can't, we caught it, we found it in these locations. We were able to, to, control, to, to quarantine those hosts we're doing a further analysis now and we're trying to determine if any other forensic evidence leads us to believe any other hosts got communicated to from those hosts. That's what I would look for to make a determination that a company actually is doing the right thing. Any company that says, yeah, we saw it. We, we can tell that uh, we ran in our network, but there's no evidence to point to us being compromised in any such way. I would say that they're probably not logging enough if they say something like that, because the, real, the reality is they're either, that's not a complete message. That's not really stating what's going on in, an, in a network or a, at a location. I'd be very reticent to, to trust any company that, that just gives a blanket statement of they're clean. That's, 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 I think the word hubris comes to mind, right? Like that's, a, that's the hubris 
comes before the nemesis. And so Since we're not, not talking about any specific company, oh yeah, hubris is the, uh, the term of choice here. Well, we are at the top of the hour and I know um, everyone's time is important these days. I wanna thank uh, my guests because this was a really fun panel to host and we're gonna be doing quite a few more of these. Thanks so much to Evan and Jan, Justin, always great to work with you. If you wanna reach out to anybody after this event, please feel free to reach them at the uh, email addresses. We will make sure we put that on our website along with a uh, recording of this in case anyone missed this. Thanks again.